Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, and I'm still pondering about what musicals we might have had if Alfred Hitchcock had decided to direct a musical film. And I'm wondering if one of the songs that might have come out of such an idea would have been You Got Trouble, My Friends, with Harry in River City, which presumably comes from the music man who knew too much. Well, let's just park that and move on to this week's episode, because it's the first of a two-part discussion that I had with Michael Gordon Shapiro, the noted composer, about what can only really be described as a parody musical. You might have heard of it. It's called Twisted, the untold story of a royal vizier. And frankly, as there aren't that many musicals about viziers, and we will touch on a few in the discussion, it probably rings a bell with you if you think, hmm, I wonder if that has anything to do with Aladdin, and in particular the 1992 Disney film version, which is a musical, of Aladdin. And if you've made that connection, you'd be absolutely correct, because Twisted, the untold story of a royal vizier, is to that Aladdin story what Wicked is, to the story of The Wizard of Oz. Except the question has to be, is it? And that's what in this week's episode we'll be discussing in some depth. Because it is a parody musical, whereas I would argue, and I know that Mike would, that Wicked is not. Wicked is sincere, but Twisted is not. And if you have an insincere story, something which is a parody, there for laughs and highly enjoyable on that basis, can it also then try to move you, and if it does, can it be successful? Well, I think it's fair to say that Twisted does try to pull that off. It does try to be both insincere and sincere at the same time. Was it successful? Well, we'll find out the views of me and Mike in just a minute as we discuss that particular issue. And I think it's quite an interesting one. I'm, I'm actually very interested in the idea of writing something which purports to be one thing, and then perhaps sneakily takes you somewhere else. But what do we know about Twisted as a musical? Well, it was written by A.J. Holmes, and he's an actor who appears in a lot of musical theatre in both America and London's West End, and is probably most connected, I think, as a performer with the Book of Mormon. And I suspect the flavours of that show come through very clearly in Twisted. And he wrote the music for the songs where the lyrics were written by Kaylee McMahon, and the book for the story was written by Eric Carn Gale and Matt Lang and Nick Lang. And as a show, it premiered on stage in Chicago in 2013. And rather pleasingly, the show was videoed. And if you want to see it, you can, because the company behind it, Star Kid Productions, has very kindly placed it on YouTube. And at the time of broadcast, that entire show... In that production from 2013 is visible to watch, and it is that version which Mike and I are discussing in our conversation coming up later in the episode. And nor did the show stop then. It has subsequently appeared in concert versions and in amateur versions. And indeed, at the 2021 virtual Edinburgh Festival Fringe, an amateur production of Twisted was also available to watch if you wanted to do so. But it's the original, you might say, that we're watching and talking about today. So, in this week's episode, we'll be discussing, as I've already said, whether or not a parody musical can sort of break free of its constraints and take you into the world of genuine emotional impact. And then next week, we'll be looking in depth at the nuts and bolts of this show to see how it was crafted. So, let's get down to business. I hope you enjoy this first half of the conversation that I had with Mike Shapiro about Twisted, the untold story of a royal vizier. Musical Talk Hello, Mike. How's it going, Fuss? 
<laughs> Do you know, that's one of those questions I never quite know how to answer <laughs> because it seems both intimate and slangy at the same time. Uh, I think in general terms, I shall rely on the tried and tested fine. Thank you, Mike. How are you? <laughs> you know, that's a chestnut of banter, but I think it holds up after all these years. So also <laughs> fine doing just peachily and delighted as always to be back on the show and chatting with you. Now, today, I'm delighted to be talking to you about a show which is accessible to everybody because we saw it on YouTube. It's the complete version of the 2013 production of Twisted, which has a subtitle which I've momentarily forgotten. The Untold Story of a Royal Vizier. Thank you. You reminded me and that was very helpful and timely, which people may or may not know, but if you like, is a musical which is, I think, in a thumbnail sketch kind of way to describe it, is trying to do for Jafar, the vizier from the Aladdin film, the Disney Aladdin film of uh, quite a while ago now, what Wicked did, of course, for <laughs> The Wicked Witch. So it's, if you like, telling the story from the point of view of Jafar and perhaps recontextualising and reframing him and his attitudes and hopes and aspirations and perhaps letting us see there might be more to the story than meets the eye. It is, of course, a comedy, and it was first produced, I believe, I believe on stage in 2013 for a limited run. That was recorded, and that's what people can see on YouTube, and we might recommend that if you wanted to, you could go and see that first before you listen to the rest of this episode, because I'm afraid there will be spoilers. And it has been performed on a number of occasions by other uh, groups, I think mostly amateur, but it has had an afterlife and is held in very high esteem by a number of people who've seen it. So it does have a little bit of a resonance, a little bit of an echo. So, Mike, can I ask, did you know anything about it before we sat down to watch it? On either side of the Atlantic, I should say. <laughs> right. I have passing familiarity with the company that both produced the premiere as well as, I believe, developed the show and wrote it, which is Star Kid. I assume they pronounce it Star Kid and not Stark ID or any of the other <laughs> possible interpretations. I know of them. I've seen another one of their shows, uh, Firebringer. I'm aware of their awe-inspiring crowdfunding campaigns where they seem to have such a expansive and loyal fan base that they can drum up tens of thousands of dollars to support their productions, which I think is fantastic. Mm. And uh, really validates this form of finance for new musicals. So I know of them that way. This particular show I had not heard of prior to your mentioning it. I do think that this is a case where if you understand the premise from the title, you kind of know what you're what you're in for. Yes, I think that's a very fair statement, to be honest. I mean, there aren't that many shows that got a vizier in them, to be brutal. There's this and Kismet, I think, essentially, plus obviously Aladdin. I'm taking this and Aladdin as a matched pair. I can't. I genuinely can't think of viziers turning up that regularly. <laughs> as positions in the civil service go, it seems to have fallen out of favour. Oh, I've just thought of one further option. There's definitely a vizier in Arthur Sullivan's last operetta. It's called The Rose of Persia. And it's Sullivan's last completed operetta. And it's got a libretto by somebody called Adrian Hood, who's Sullivan's most Gilbert-like, non-Gilbert librettist. And there's a cracking song in it which contains a vizier. It's the Sultan and uh, his servants, including a vizier, going out into the streets dressed as dervishes just to um, enjoy themselves away from the duties of their palace life. And it's the most Gilbert-like lyric of a non-Gilbert operetta with Sullivan's music. I will now leave that story entirely alone, but I think that means we've brought the tally of Vizier-based musicals up to four. Right. <laughs> Sultans seem to fare a little bit better than Viziers in terms of presence in stage musicals and dramas. Yes, I suppose so. They are sort of a generic ruler, are they not? And um, that, that you will find one in every version of Aladdin, for example, in pantomime form uh, in the United Kingdom at Christmas. But dragging us back to this version of a telling of the story of Jafar, before we go into it, I think we probably just need a very quick thumbnail sketch. Mike, do you want to very briefly explain some of the beats of the story? Sure. So as you described earlier, this is following in the footsteps of Wicked in that it is trying to retell a well-known musical story from the point of view of the alleged antagonist, who in this telling is shown to have deeper values, more noble motivations, and more of a personal stake than we would be led to believe by the canonical Aladdin film. And as with Wicked, we are intended to bond with the uh, so-called villain and perhaps reconsider to what extent this person is the villain. 
more specifically, we uh, let's see. I'm going to try to find a, a, a bird's eye view of the show that doesn't reveal too many spoilers yet, and then maybe later on, if we want to go into spoilery territory, uh, we can we can venture there. But big picture is that we are seeing Jafar portrayed as a well-intended middleman in the civil service of the Sultan. And Jafar is attempting to revitalize a kingdom that perhaps once had its glory days and now has fallen into a bit of a lull or a torpor. There is a unsubtle implication that the kingdom in the show is meant to be representative of Disney as such. Perhaps Disney of of a few years ago, because uh, Disney seems to be charging on on all cylinders these days. But there's definitely an analogy to be drawn to maybe Disney, I don't know, pre pre Alan Menken. Yeah, sort of '90s doldrums Disney, to use a shorthand phrase, perhaps. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting more specificity into this than I think I should. But anyway, so we have we have the kingdom, and we have Jafar portrayed alternately as a young, idealistic impending member of the bureaucracy who wants to institute reforms and bring the kingdom back to its former glory. And we also see present day Jafar, uh, present day meaning contemporary with the Disney movie of Aladdin, where he is frustrated, he retains his ideals, but he's seen tragedy and sorrow. So uh, we are seeing him in his struggle to help the kingdom move forward, despite the obstruction of corrupt politicians chief of whom is the sultan, who is portrayed as a bit of a a nincompoop, Um, (laughs) and also Aladdin, who here is portrayed as a more conventional form of thief, uh, as opposed to the romanticized thief of the Disney movie. Here, Aladdin is portrayed as a unrepentant burglar and uh, serial sexual abuser, which is somewhat uh, discomforting. He's a sociopath, at least, if not further. <laughs> right, but in the in the tradition of the sort of entertaining sociopath, the uh, the Gaston tradition, where he's presented, we, we're seeing someone with so few virtues and so many flaws uh, that are so exaggerated that it's it's meant to be funny rather than meant to disturb us. We can discuss mm. to what extent they struck that balance. Uh, So Jafar has to contend with the uh, impossibility of his mandate of helping the kingdom. One detail that happened so early that I don't consider this a spoiler. One of the many suitors that Jasmine spurned has suffered some physical injury from the encounter with Jasmine, uh, something that in a Disney universe might be a comedic equivalent of dynamite exploding in somebody's face and now their (laughs) face is covered with soot and they shake their head and they're fine. But here the show explores the diplomatic ramifications of of injuring a suitor to the princess. And in this case, we have Prince Ahmed, I believe, of the neighboring kingdom of Pixar. <laughs> Brackets, subtle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the analogy here is probably perceivable by everyone. But the Pixarian um, ruler is so put off by Jasmine's uh, spurning him and the um, manner in which she did so, which resulted in some uh, injury, that he has vowed revenge in the form of military conquest. So now Jafar has to deal with the impending assault from the neighboring kingdom. To the extent to which this is meant to be a allegory for Disney's relationship with Pixar is up for debate. I think there's sort of a, a mild correlation between the history of those two companies that we see during the show. But I don't, I don't think that the overly comedic Ahmed is really meant to imply that Pixar is uh, as eccentrically incompetent, I think. The analogy only goes so far. Indeed, yes, absolutely. And and just briefly, that character is almost treated as a throwaway on his two major and significant appearances. The first time, I think there's a line to the effect that he's actually... um, He's essentially a minor character who's been brought in purely to prove that Jasmine isn't vastly interested in getting married to anyone and doesn't actually have any function in his own right. And then when he arrives in Act 2 to have a function in his own right, people seem amazed to see him again because there's actually an overt statement to the effect of, oh, he has come back. That was a surprise, wasn't it, kind of thing. Yeah, there's a lot of metatextual humour, a lot of acknowledging the characters in with respect to their function in the Disney movie from which they came. One of the things that I think is about the strength and weakness of the film is the style of humor that happens in concentration at the start of the musical, where there's a lot of literal exploration of the ramifications of things that occurred in the Disney movie, which were meant as just disposable comedic moments. 
And this show says, what would happen if that actually transpired? What would happen if Aladdin went on this thieving rampage through a, a busy bazaar and causing physical slapstick injury left and right? And what is the psychology of a young man who thinks he can just steal whatever he wants? Like the show explores all of that in a way that's much more literal than you would ever expect from a Disney film. So that is a recurring humor staple in the show. Let's see what else. We... I'm, I'm going to kind of back away from details because I don't want to spoil too much, but we learn that Jafar has a tragic romantic past with someone from uh, Mideastern folk mythology, though not necessarily from the Disney original, and that he is tied up in the quest to find the gene, the genie, in a way that surpasses Aladdin's quest and relationship with the genie in the original Disney film. So he's kind of got a stake in finding uh, getting the services of the genie in order to help a past relationship. And things come to a head as the neighboring kingdom of Pixar musters its troops and gets ready to invade. And uh, Jasmine, who here is portrayed as a spoiled, want sort of a parody of a self-absorbed, perhaps American high school student who's very much involved in causes and activism without shining a reflective eye back on herself and seeing how she is part of the problem she is protesting. Can I just say that she now, this version, is what I think is now popularly known in societal terms as a Disney princess, in the sense that it's not a reflection on actually what Disney princesses or their representation have been in a whole host of films. It's the idea that actually Disney's been so influential in society that uh, there's a whole host of uh, young girls, or there has it's been recognised that young girls sometimes aspire towards the princess-style lifestyle, and actually it's now used as a pejorative term, or certainly I've heard it used as a pejorative term. She's a bit of a Disney princess. It's generally meaning she's a bit of a spoiled brat who isn't prepared to put the effort in to get what they might want. And to that point, there is some lampooning throughout the show of the kind of aspiration you might expect to find in any musical, where somebody has a a spirit, a a never-say-die spirit of dreaming your dream and wanting what you want and reaching for the stars... And it's presented here as a bit impractical, uh, a bit foolish. And in contrast to this, Jafar is portrayed as the more balanced voice of pragmatism and reason in contrast. So he he wants the, the kingdom to achieve a kind of economic sustainability, whereas everyone in the kingdom seems much more impulsive. And there, there's very much a, a parody of the classic I want it all spirit, so endemic to musical theater. Yeah, I think that's fair. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Jafar, let's, you know, it, this boils down to the fact that Jafar is the hero of this interpretation. And he is, for the most part, a tragic hero. We can discuss how far or how little that becomes true or develops. But he is a tragic hero in the middle of a maelstrom of terror and horribleness. <laughs> yes. Essentially trying to bring order to what is actually a very chaotic set of worlds or um, land. You know, the world that's being drawn is not one in which I would want to spend any time. And how he gets through that in the way that he does get through that uh, is essentially the crux of how the plot develops. I I agree. That's that's a good abstract description without giving anything away. So let's get on a little bit to the nitty gritty. Now, I'm going to have to say something very strange about this musical. As this conversation unfolds, it will become very quickly apparent. So I'm going to say it overtly now that I found there was a very great deal to enjoy. There was actually much more in this that moved me than I thought was going to move me. And indeed, that was quite a surprise because it was it took me quite a long time to realise that actually there was going to be anything in here that might even be faintly emotionally nourishing, to use a phrase. And it is it's there's a lot of it which is terribly cleverly written. There's a lot of lyrical flourishes. There's a lot of dialogue flourishes. So there's a lot to enjoy. And so when I talk about some of the things I didn't enjoy so much, I want people to put that in context of what I'm saying. So there was a lot to enjoy in it as well. And we will be talking a lot about that. But I'm going to start by saying to you, Mike, that I think this musical is odd in one very significant way. And that is we've all heard of second act trouble. It's a problem that occurs in a lot, if not the majority of musicals and indeed not just musicals. But it seems to be particularly prevalent in a musical where a really good idea is made to work really well in act one. And then in act two, you've got to find something else to do. And it's very often 
well, we'll take the status quo, which in a way has been achieved at the end of Act One, because that seems to be the arc sometimes rather than a, a stopping off point towards chaos, which can then be rebuilt. So and Into the Woods, for example, the, the Stephen Sondheim is a very good uh, example of this kind of thing. Uh, whether or not one uh, likes it, just from a, a narrative point of view, Act One is perfect in one sense. You know, it, it's a very satisfying whole. And then Act Two has to come along and kick over the traces in order to give you variation and develop the characters. But of course, it's not as good and it doesn't end as well. And Act Two has always been just a little bit disappointing in Into the Woods. Please don't write to me. <laughs> so that's what happens in many, many, many musicals. Twisted, I think, is one of the most rare things I've ever seen in the sense that I think Act Two is infinitely better than Act One. And the reason I think that is because it's where almost all the emotional journey takes place. So the structure of this show, and this is what I'd like to start talking about with you, if I may, Mike, is very curious. Act one is essentially the story of Jafar as he goes through, as you say, his middle age, where he's in this uh, kingdom that isn't functioning very well, and he's not been able to make change. And it's so, you know, um, he's having to live with the unpleasantness and he's being blamed for it. There's this brief uh, a flashback scene, as you said, which show his ideal youth. But essentially, it's point to point act one. So Jafar meets characters in one scene, and then he meets another character in scene two, and then he meets another character in scene three, and then he meets another character in scene four. There is one character who keeps coming up, but that's the sort of the captain of the royal guard. But even he's really a narrative device. He doesn't actually have much to do. So the characters who have something to do, Jasmine, Aladdin, the Sultan, uh, people like that, turn up, they do their thing, they're introduced, they may or may not have a small interaction with Jafar, they may even have a big interact with, uh, action with him, and then they move on, or rather he moves on to the next scene. So it's scene after scene after scene in a very linear kind of a way. And what that reminds me of more than anything, funnily enough, is the biopic, for want of a better phrase, musical. I was discussing this on Musical Talk some months ago about Carnegie, the star-spangled Scotchman, which was a musical about Andrew Carnegie. And the problem is, when you're telling the life of an individual, it's got to be point-to-point -point and episodic, because there's no way you're going to get 70-plus years of any depth into that story. So, you know, in that, he met his wife. And that was the extent of his relationship. You were told he was married. You know, it was lovely. There she was. He was married, suddenly moves on to the next episode in his life. Act one is Jafar's point to point story setting up act two, as I saw it. Once all the subplots, not that any of them have become subplots yet, once all the characters have been established and a context have been established, which is what act one does in act two, then they're allowed to start integrating, it seems to me. And in that integration, suddenly we get at least some emotional journeys. Two or three of the characters are allowed to develop as characters. Two or three are not. And this is where some of the spoilers are going to come in. So I'm going to have to say this. Jasmine develops and Jafar develops by, by far the farthest. It is his story. And it develops in such a way that actually you're taken into places of despair with him, of happiness with him. You see his ingenuity. It was genuinely able to engage me. And then by a very clever route, I thought, it sets you up to a scene where you think he's going to be... And once again, here's a spoiler. He meets a lot of other Disney villains who are in the same boat as he, or at least most of them are. So they come in and bewail and sympathise with him about the bad luck they've had and how their story has been misrepresented to make them look villainous when in fact they weren't. So you've got that situation. And you think, oh, right, so this is the point where he's going to turn bad. Uh, and then it confounds you. It turns out that that isn't what happens. And then he does an ingenious bit of uh, thinking, actually, towards the end when Jeopardy requires it. And he does this incredible thinking. And then he comes up with a solution which is both tragic and happy at the same time. And in the process, saves the day and helps Jasmine flourish and flower into the woman she should be. So suddenly, Act Two acts like a musical. Interwoven plots, character development, emotional rides and uh, a bit of carpet pulling. When you think you're going in one direction, it takes you into another direction. So I really liked Act 2. But the flip, therefore, is I didn't like Act 1 because it was so point to point. As I say, I, I did some timing. I think it was about 55 minutes before any character apart from the captain of the guard came back. 
So it was it takes an hour for any interweaving to take place at all. So uh, I've done a lot of talking there and I will want to sort of flesh some of that out. But uh, does that ring any bells with you or do you take a different approach? It does in that I didn't think of it as act one versus act two because I wasn't really tracking where the more emotionally resonant stuff was happening. But I'll I'll trust your analysis that act two is a little more um, sincere and emotionally moving and not just a parody. I, I think what really had resonance, if we want to think of this as something that's dipping its toes into being a traditional storytelling musical, in addition to being a parody, mm. uh, is all about Jafar's backstory, his, again, since we're in the spoiler zone, I'll I'll take advantage of that a little bit, his uh, his past encounter with Shahrazad, who, who, who loves him so thoroughly that she warms his cold heart and gives him a sense of hope, and his tragic loss of her. Uh, and his desire to get her back through the genie, who is referred to the, mm. the more historical name of Jin here. I think that's that's the only character with a sincere motive and one we can relate to, and therefore the only character who has emotional weight. And it isn't. Uh, it takes a while for the show to enter the flashback world and show us that romantic connection, and then let us get a sense of his frustration because he had this woman who was his ideal and she was taken away. And he has this one somewhat sketchy supernatural opportunity, apparently, as far as he knows, to re-encounter her or to somehow salvage that relationship. So at this point, we have the, the, the requirements for a musical. Typically, we've got the sympathetic character on a quest for something important. Mm. So I think I agree with you that that... I don't think you said this. I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit. But what I think you are implying... They're good words. Carry on. I, I think this is the part of the show that feels like a musical rather than just a parody. Yes, absolutely. And so this gives us a, an interesting... We've probably got to talk about what is a parody musical and what is what we might call, just for the opportunity to make a contrast, more mainstream standard musicals, and what happens when they mo- merge or at least move towards each other. Right. Because this is a parody musical, and I think that's illustrated actually brilliantly in that opening song where Jafar who's in his middle-aged uh, phase of being the um, vizier and hasn't achieved much by way of making things better because the situation is still conspiring against him because of a, a sort of a corrupt oligarchy if you like uh, of controllers for, under the sultan but he's wandering through the town and everyone is blaming him for all their woes and ills. But it very quickly becomes apparent they're blaming him for things which he has no responsibility for uh, at all. It's, so it becomes almost a ridiculous world very, very quickly. So it contrasts his, you know, he is the humane and human character in a world of cartoons right. in real terms because all the other characters cannot function. You know, you could not take them out of that story as written at that point and put them in any other play or you couldn't even conceive of them in real life because their worldview is entirely described, if you like, uh, and I'm using the word described in the uh, the sense of locus and maths. What, what fun. <laughs> what a way to describe musicals through the world of maths. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the it's described through their hatred of him, even though their hatred is ultimately irrational. You know, it's 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 insane. <laughs> it's a little bit like how in the TV show Parks and Recreation, uh, everyone is sadistic to Gary, even though or Jerry, even though he hasn't really done anything other than be slightly uh, uninspiring. But yeah, so there there's a comedy drawn from the fact that everyone seems to hate Jafar well beyond anything he could have possibly deserved. I, I think it's useful to to differentiate a parody from a musical comedy because the former is really a subtype of the latter. But in my mind, the real distinction is that a parody's purpose is to ridicule somebody else's work or idea. That's its primary goal. And it does it through caricature of the contents of that show. So I think you can draw a distinction between Aladdin here as a parody and Wicked, which is not a parody. Because Wicked's purpose is to tell a new story or to retell an existing story in a sincere way. Ah. And its purpose is not to send up the original characters or to point out the foibles of that universe. Whereas in this case, that's really the main thrust of a lot of the show, is just to um, unpack what's in the Disney original and to say, uh, to tacitly say this is kind of goofy and... <laughs> well, if it was Disney, of course they'd say it was goofy. <laughs> well done. Well Sorry. done. But I mean, all right, so, so big... 
a practical difference is in a parody, parodies kind of take place in an alternate universe where it's okay if the main characters are terrible people as long as it's funny. Mm. So Jasmine here is a unrepentant slave owner and she's pretty cruel to her slaves. And she tells them they're part of the problem. I mean, yes. Right, exactly. She is, she's sadistic and it's meant to be a satire. It's meant to poke fun at the idea of a, I think, of benevolent princess in an autocratic society. And uh, Aladdin, likewise, you know, they, they look at the idea of the lovable thief and they turn it on its head and they say, well, it's not that actually mm-hmm. lovable to be a, a burglar, uh, a singing burglar who is making light of his crimes. And, and obviously there's a lot of there's an incidental sending up of Beauty and the Beast uh, in the opening number. So the, the entire emotional orientation of the show is a often mean-spirited humor. And I think that's okay. It's certainly deconstructionist, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Definitely. But it's sadistic, right? Because we have people just saying the F word to Jafar for no reason. It's it's meant to be amusingly cruel and vulgar. Yes, yes, that's true. And that's part of what a parody does. Um, this is sort of the Mad Magazine tradition, which is a reference I know <laughs> that you will get, and maybe some of our listeners will. But once you have a parody universe, you you are absolved a lot of a lot of the responsibilities that I think you are in a sincere musical because you don't necessarily need to like your main characters in the same way or to be able to identify with them. Or make them consistent, necessarily. Yeah, there, there does not have to be cause and effect either in the outside world or in the character's motivations because the purpose of a parody, again, is to ridicule something else rather than to create a story in its own right. So I think there are cases where I think musicals try to straddle the the boundary between a parody musical and a sincere musical or something that feels like a parody-like universe. Would You're in Town be a good example of this, do you think? That's a prime example because even though it's not a parody per se, I mean, I think it's a little bit maybe Brechtian in style, (laughs) but it's not satirizing a particular work of art. But... It takes place, I, I'd like to say informally, it takes place in a parody universe. You know, everybody's terrible um, in a funny way. Uh, even the, the the protagonists are vapid. Yeah. I think that once you are in the parody universe, it's very hard to get out. Uh, I think it's very hard to establish a sincere emotional connection to the audience because we've already told the audience this is a parody universe. Things are going to be crass. People are going to be um, despicable. And it's okay, because again, our purpose here is to ridicule something else. So I think this show suffers, even when it does tread into more sincere realms, it just suffers from the fact that it's set up as a parody. And it's hard to fully latch onto a character and feel with them when they live in this universe already. And can I ask, I mean, I accept everything you say there because I think that it chimes in entirely with what I was, uh, I'm going to have to say, feel as well as thinking uh, as I watched this through its uh, complete two-act version. But do you feel the same thing about Jafar? Are you able to say that even in this sort of grotesque world of uh, parody characters who are, you know, who are very far from being human or humane, that Jafar is somehow able to do that, or at least over the course of the story, become someone that you could feel that. Because that I did feel that. I felt that he... I, I take on board your point that it's hard once you're in parody to get out of parody. But I felt that his character... And to a lesser degree, Jasmine, but his character in particular did sort of get an escape velocity, even though obviously he stayed within the story to get to the end. Otherwise, it'd be very odd if he walked through, uh, walked out uh, two thirds of the way through. Although I suppose in a way, <laughs> the narrator in Into the Woods is uh, written out that way, but not satisfactorily. So um, I suppose I'm really asking, how did you respond to Jafar by the end? And did he escape the parody world? In my point of view, not fully. Mm. Uh, there was some degree to which I was starting to see him as a sincere character, uh, but I was always reminded of the universe in which he lived and the intentions of the creator of the show in uh, aping Aladdin and making it so vulgar and having um, you know so many dirty jokes and, again, setting up a world where even the more sympathetic characters are you know, propping up a evil slave-endorsing regime... Once once we've gotten all those jokes, those very expensive jokes, um, I can never quite... Like, I would not bond with Jafar the way I would bond with Elphaba in seeing Wicked. Wicked is in a fantastic universe, of course, 
but it's a sincere one from the start. And even though there is a kind of subversion against the Wizard of Oz in portraying the wizard very differently than he is um, described in the movie and I presume the books, it's still not a parody. Um, they don't call him the Wizard of Snaz, and they don't turn him into a complete inept fool, right? They, he, he's more of a substantial villain in that show. You've just turned him into Jeremy Durante in my head, by the way, and you've brought me more joy right. in that one sentence than I've had all week. So thank you very much for planting that little idea in my head. Do carry on, please, Mike. Well, what a, what a bleak week that must have been. Um, Ha-cha-cha-cha-cha! <laughs> but you see the distinction. It, it, it really it boils down to, like, what is the intention of the creators? And if the intention of the creators is let's make fun of something, then I can never quite fully get aboard when they say let's sympathize with a character who has real needs. Mm. I can sort of, I, I'm sort of stuck in the space between two stools, right? It's neither fish nor fowl. It's not equivalent to another fantastical musical with mythological characters that is sincere because here we're still stuck in that world. Um, It's like reading a sincere, it's it's like as if like Bart Simpson had a a crisis, right? (laughs) Like I could kind of sympathize a little bit, but it's still the Simpsons. So I think there is this intrinsic awkwardness when you try to bridge that gap. Uh, I think you can point to the same phenomenon in Book of Mormon, which uh, also tries to bridge a parody-like world uh, with moments of sincerity, with limited success in my mind. Um, And I think that was one of the major limitations of that show. And I think we're seeing a a similar phenomenon here. Now, that does chime in very well, as I say, with my emotional responses, which is not something I talk about a great deal on Musical Talk, mostly because I try never to have them. Um, I am British, after all. (laughs) Write that down. But um, essentially, I found Act One, as you'll have gathered, quite hard going. As I say, I was impressed by some of the dazzling wordplay and some of the very clever lyrics. You know, there's a real veneer... Um, which is different from a vazir, of course, um, a real veneer and sheen to the dexterousness, the dexterity on display uh, in essentially the words. And so I, en- I, I enjoyed it, if you like, as a series of uh, snacks. But in terms of um, when I got to the end of Act One, I thought... I am not being presented with anything that makes this feel anything other than hollow. It's like an Easter egg. It's beautifully wrapped. Uh, There's a very nice outer casing. And then there's the inner chocolate, but it's very thin uh, and certainly wouldn't sustain you as a meal. And then within, there is nothing. It is hollow. And so Act 1 left me hollow. And I will tell you this. I watched Act 1 and didn't want to watch Act 2 immediately. I actually watched Act 2 the day afterwards because I really couldn't face more of the same. Now, when I went into Act 2, as you'll have gathered, I got more out of it, I think, than you. I'd also had that big interval of a day. And that, I think, either allowed me to recalibrate or because Act 2 seems to me to feel very different in terms of its decisions, um, might be the best way of putting it, I enjoyed Act 2 infinitely better and therefore I was ready to go with Jafar as all the stuff that have just been sort of thrown on the table in Act 1, very cleverly thrown on the table, or rather arranged on the table, but without much point, suddenly seem to be allowed to develop wings and fly a bit. Or, for me, more than you, I think, Mike. But I, I did enjoy his journey and felt for him and was very pleased that uh, the story concluded in the way that it did for him it seemed to be the best possible denouement for a tragic hero, which is what I've been sort of perceiving him. I, we're not talking Hamlet here because of, a, as you say, the lack of sincerity about all the other characters. But his character was sincere in a world of non-sincerity, or so it seemed to me. And so he was about the only one who could do it. Jasmine has no obvious reason to suddenly grow up, particularly, um, but she does. There is a sense that the catalyst is a revelation uh, that... Uh, Jafar makes and actually there are a couple of rather nice moments that they share funnily enough which sort of I think she is if you like I don't let me put this better I think that her development is made the better because of his development but I can't see any of the other characters in the piece developing at all so I, I think two of them essentially become characters maybe that's the best way of putting it So I probably got more emotionally out of it than you by the sound of it. But I absolutely agree that the parody nature of it does leave it a rather thin meal at best. And certainly Act One was not at best, where it was essentially um, just table dressing. 
But I'm fully aware that uh, this all sounds very negative because I enjoyed a great deal of it. But I think possibly the way to describe it was I admired much of it, uh, by which I mean the the lyrical dexterity, much more than I did the substance of it. You know, the plot did what it needed to do in the sense that it... Um, it filled in all the gaps that you weren't seeing in Aladdin, but you could imagine were taking place at the same time. So it did that kind of clever connection thing. And you can sort of, you know, it's um, if you know noise is off, it's 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 uh, it's act two where the stage is being viewed by you, the audience from behind. So suddenly you can see the working. So that's very much what we got. So it looked very neat and dovetaily and neatness and dovetailiness is very satisfying in that sense, you know, it was an intellectual joy. Maybe that's too strong a word, but it was certainly intellectually engaging to say, I see what they're doing here. That fits in very nicely with my memories of Aladdin. Very much appreciate what's going on there. Um, and then, as I say, I'm going to have to start talking in a minute about some of these uh, moments of uh, verbal dexterity because to, I need to back up what I'm saying. But there was enough of that to keep me entertained. But you get to the interval, which is when, you know, you historically draw breath in any show and I drew breath and I thought but you know I've I've been watching a kaleidoscope lots of lovely colours lots of lovely moving stones absolutely meaningless in terms of a picture it's sort of abstract so I, I did get the sense if it was well you've said parody I think cartoon certainly grotesque and then there's this gear change in act two I'm not saying I'm, I'm not sure I'm adding much to what you've just said to be honest except that was my journey through it Musical talk. And that's where we leave it for this week. You heard Mike and me talking about the nature of a parody musical and whether or not it can successfully escape its own limits to become something more. As you could tell, we had slightly different views. But I think we both agree that it's a show well worth watching and it's certainly a show with great craft. And it's that craft that we'll be talking about as we continue our conversation in next week's episode. So I do hope you'll come back for that. The show is highly entertaining and there is some real craft, some real skill in the songwriting. Now, you might remember at the beginning of that conversation, we were talking about how often the character of a vizier turns up in musical theatre. And the answer is not that often, but perhaps more often than you think. And off the top of our heads, we immediately came up with Kismet and the Rose of Persia. So I thought it would be fun to just wrap up today's episode with a five minute chat about Kismet the Musical. And I stress the musical because it wasn't written as one. It was originally a play written in 1911 by Edward Knobloch, which is quite the name to conjure with for the London West End stage. Now, that original version, which opened in London in April 1911, was not a musical. But as was common in the theatre of that time, it did have music written for it by a man called Christopher Wilson. And that show was so successful, it ran for two years in the West End and opened on Broadway on Christmas Day, the very self-same year that it opened in London. That's 1911. And not only that... It was then filmed in 1920 and again in 1930 and again in 1944. All of those are filmed versions or adaptations of that 1911 non-musical version. But as you can tell, it was one of those perennial shows and was eventually turned into a musical for the stage on Broadway in 1953. And by 1955 had been so successful that it was made into a film by MGM featuring Howard Keel as Hadge the main character, who is both a beggar and a poet, in case you didn't know it, and whose main antagonist in the piece is the vizier, who comes to a sticky end. Now, the thing about the 1953 Broadway version is that it is a musical. It's a musicalisation of that 1911 play, and it has music adapted by Robert Wright and George Forrest, who also wrote the lyrics. But I do say adapted for the music because it was borrowed very heavily from Alexander Borodin, the Russian composer, who had died in 1887, and so didn't really have a chance to object. Although it did do his music a lot of good in the popular sphere, as I suspect he could never have imagined during his life that he might find that his melodies were creating chart hits for people as diverse as Peggy Lee and 
Tony Bennett. And if you don't think you know Kismet, I'll bet you know one or two of the songs, because Baubles, Bangles and Beads has escaped. But of course, the most famous is the song Stranger in Paradise, a song which has a particular popularity in the United Kingdom, because on the year of its recording, the British audiences managed to send Tony Bennett's 1953 recording to the top of the UK charts. And then... Five other versions by different performers also charted in 1955. Although I must say that my favourite song from the score is The Olive Tree, which comes in the middle of Act Two. And as a show, its enduring success continues, because not that many years ago, 2007, which was after Musical Talk had started broadcasting, the English National Opera Company staged it in London at the Coliseum. So there you have it. That's Kismet. And I thought it would just be useful to have a five minute chat, as I say, about this show, not least because it's one of those shows that is important in the world of 20th century musical theatre, but also because it has a vizier as a central character, not unlike Twisted, which brings me back very nicely to Twisted, the untold story of a royal vizier and the conversation I had with Mike Shapiro about it, the second part of which you can hear next week. And as you can probably tell, that's me really winding up this episode. Hopefully only the episode, although I can well accept that I might very well have wound you up as well. Let's say no more about it and finish. And I'll do that now with one simple word. Spoken by one simple ton. Anyway, here it is. Goodbye. This episode of Musical Talk presented by Mike Shapiro and Thos Ribbits and edited by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2022. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website, www.musicaltalk.co.uk or subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at MusicalTalkThos. Alrighty, I am ready to roll. Splendid, and so am I. So, um, I'll start in the usual way. If you're if you're happy for me to do the introduction, Mike. At your leisure. I mean, I, d- I don't I don't want to stop you doing it if you if you fancy a crack. <laughs> uh, you are inimitable, so I won't attempt to imitate. <laughs> you're you're very kind. So that sort of brings us to the end of this. As I said earlier, there's a lot of Disney references piled in so i'm going to go for one of my own they do actually make reference to a whole new world the interesting thing is that this of course being the story told that has already been told means that it isn't a whole this is rubbish i'm not going to use any of that goodness (laughs) me thomas what this is what comes of not having enough sleep does for you um yeah i hope that made the blooper section of this episode by the way